Hello, this is Dr. Eric Bricker. Thank you for watching A Healthcare Z. Today's training session is on how hospitals really work, clinical training for non-clinical healthcare professionals. Now, thank you so much for being here today. This is my favorite time of the week is to be able to speak with all of you or at least meet with all of you virtually as let's go through some of the different departments in the hospital. You've got radiology, where you've got CTs, MRIs, X-rays, PET scans, and GIs, uh, and, and GI uh, radiology. So that's like where you swallow contrast, like barium, and then they take X-rays of the barium to see how it's flowing through your gastrointestinal tract. That's done through the radiology department. Uh, then there's interventional radiology, which is where they actually, do, and, and interventional radiology actually looks a lot like this. So this is actually a cardiac cath lab, but interventional radiology looks the same way. This right here is what's referred to as a C-arm, where you can take uh, actually movies with an x-ray. You can barely see it, but this is an actual TV screen where you can see a movie. And this is where the interventional radiologist is using the imaging to stick drains in like abscesses to drain the pus without surgery. We're going to take biopsies, let's say, from a part of the piece of the lung, and they're using the imaging to guide where the needle goes into the lung to take the biopsy, or place what's referred to as an, an IVC filter, which is an inferior vena cava filter, which is a very common procedure at a hospital. When people have what's referred to as a DVT, a deep vein thrombosis, which is a blood clot in their legs, it breaks off and then goes to the lungs, which is then referred to as a pulmonary embolism. And that is potentially lethal. People die from pulmonary uh, embolisms. And not everybody who has a DVT and a pulmonary embolism requires an IVC filter to basically, if any more clot breaks loose from their legs, the filter in their large vein of their abdomen actually catches that blood clot before it then travels further to the lungs, preventing the pulmonary embolism. So I won't get into detail any more about that, but just know that that's a common procedure that's done by the interventional radiologist as well. And then of course there's cardiac catheterization. This actually is uh, the cardiac cath lab and there's uh, the, most likely the cardiologist here. There's actually a patient underneath this blue drape. This person here is called the circulating nurse. Um, and this person could be another cardiologist or could be an assistant or a PA. And this is where the person lies flat and they actually enter the person's artery through their groin. And then they snake a catheter up through their artery into the left side of their heart. And that's where they can actually go into the coronary arteries to put to, to, to do balloon angioplasty where you open up a blockage and then you put in a stent all done through the catheters here. And then you can monitor, they have them on an EKG or telemetry so that they can constantly monitor how the heart is electrically functioning while they're doing these uh, procedures. So obviously for things like not only angioplasty and stents for heart attacks, but also in the, what's referred to as the electrophysiology lab or the EP lab, which is sort of a specialized heart lab where they'll put do ablations for a condition called atrial fibrillation, where the heart is just beating erratically and too fast. And you can actually burn small areas of the heart that are electrically defective, if you will. And by destroying that electrically defective part of the heart, very, on a, again, a microscopic level, then you can actually stop the atrial fibrillation from happening. That's a very common procedure. And then you also have pacemakers that are put in in the, uh, the EP lab uh, as well. Another department would be endoscopy. This would be where the gastroenterologists are doing the upper endoscopies, which are referred to as EGDs, or the colonoscopies. Then, of course, there's the operating room, which, again, is mostly outpatient. And then you have inpatient surgeries for joints and spine, emergency surgeries like... Um, uh, you know, ruptured appendix, cancer surgeries like on tumors, coronary artery bypass graft, uh, valve replacements like aortic valve replacements. A AAA is an abdominal aortic aneurysm, so that's a very significant vascular surgery uh, that's performed on an inpatient basis. Um, there's cardiac stress testing, so this is where the the nuclear stress tests are done in the hospital. There's of course lab and then phlebotomists. So sometimes the nurses do their own blood draws, but typically they have specialized phlebotomists where all they do is go around drawing blood all day long. Um, now. There's also, of course, the pharmacy, um, and then there is the uh, the blood bank. Again, sort of similar to oxygen. Countless lives in America have been saved 
because of blood transfusions. And so all hospitals have a blood bank because you have to be like matched to the right type of blood and it's frozen and they got to thaw it. And so um, all of this, the blood work um, and the, the, a lot of the medications and the blood is actually transferred through the tubing system. And everybody who works in healthcare needs to understand the tubing system. So you can barely see it right here, but here's the tubing system. Here's how you transport stuff around the hospital. Now, sometimes people go around with carts, um, et cetera, but a lot of the stuff is transferred by the tubing system. And why is that important? Because stuff is constantly coming and going. You can both receive things and send things through the tubing system. And you like push a button for like where you want to send it to. Now, the problem with the tubing system is that things will sit in the tubes after they've been tubed to you. Let me give you two examples. Things will be tubed to the lab and a lot of times they'll sit at the lab before they actually get processed. And for certain blood samples, if they sit for too long for like a lactate, then you get an inaccurate reading. Likewise, a lot of medications are tubed to the floor and they actually have protocols for how frequently the tubing system is checked. Or sometimes they don't have protocols over how frequently the tubing system is checked. So. You can go by the tubing system and be like, oh, look, there's a tube with something in it that's been sitting in the tubing system for a long time. And I'm not saying anybody's lazy, but they're busy. And shoot, that could be a stat medication that the physician ordered electronically that they want the patient to be given like rapidly. And believe it or not, a lot of hospitals have protocols where stat literally means within one hour. So like, and a lot of doctors don't know that. They're like, oh, stat, that means they're going to get it right away. No, if the medication is not on the floor, it has to be tubed from, it has to be filled with the pharmacy, tubed to the floor. The nurse has to get it out of the tubing system. They got to give it to the patient. And like, that oftentimes does not happen within an hour. So honestly, one of the things that I would do is, is if I ordered something stat, I would then walk to the pharmacy, be like, I need this filled now. And they would fill it for me. I would walk it to the nurse on the floor and be like, I just ordered this stat. And typically it would be like an, uh, an antibiotic for like a person who like just had their infection identified. And frankly, their heart rate was kind of high. Their blood pressure was kind of low and they were becoming septic. And so the sooner you got in those antibiotics, the better. I'd be like, look, you need to hang this now. Like, like unless you got an emergency going on with some other patient, like I need you to hang this right now. And I'd be nice about it. But just know that again, from a process perspective, there are major breakdowns constantly. Again, it requires the heroics. I'm not saying I'm a hero, but it requires the heroics of the nurses and the docs and the techs to constantly make up for these breakdowns in processes at the hospital. All right, moving on. Patient room, departments, and of course, nutrition, the food. We got to talk about the food. Now, the important thing about nutrition is the lack of nutrition. What is referred to as an NPO, nothing per oral or none per oral. Patients are kept NPO and cannot eat constantly at the hospital. So you want to talk about hospitalization? Let me tell you what hospitalization is all about. Hospitalization, you constantly get interrupted. You can't get any sleep and you, don't, you can't eat. And we wonder why the elderly patients get delirium in the hospital, okay? So this, this is not as, as much of a big deal for younger patients, but it's very, very common for the elderly to have an altered mental state where they get confused. And I literally saw a guy once who constantly thought that his call bell was a fishing pole and he would literally throw his call bell across the room because he was like casting because uh, he thought he was fishing. Um, and, oh man, now we're getting spammed. All right, so forget this. I'm going to I'm gonna try to, to, to block this particular uh, user, so I apologize about that. All right, now, um, so just know that um, people are often, often hungry and sleep deprived because they're kept NPO for various tests and procedures. And like, if the you know, what happens is, is okay, you're, you're testing your procedures in the afternoon. Well, you're kept MPO after midnight, which means you go from not eating anything, let's say at 8 or 9 p.m. to like 3 in the afternoon, and it's very common for your test or procedure to get canceled. So there you go, and you've waited all day, and you can't eat, and then like you got to go through it all over again because they move it to the next day. So it's miserable. 